Hi, welcome to my latest video. Today I'm going to be investigating the cause of my check engine light, which has recently decided to come on. If I start the engine, I can show you which light I mean. It's this one here, this orange engine symbol. That came on about three days ago whilst driving along and is now showing all the time. That usually means there's something wrong with the air and fuel side of the, the engine rather than the electrical side. It usually means that a sensor has detected something wrong with the pressure from the turbo charger or the what's called the lambda sensor or oxygen sensor and the exhaust is de detecting a, uh, a strange emissions kind of situation so I'm not sure why mine is coming on what I'm going to do is use my little code reader plug it in and see what it says a couple of other things I've noticed recently so for a few months now I've heard a, a high-pitched whistling sound when I've accelerated hard and when I asked on the Facebook group some people said that sounds like one of your intercooler hoses has got a split in it when the boost was building up it was creating a sort of a whistling sound as the air was escaping another thing I've noticed recently is that when I accelerate it, it sounds as if the heater blower is is blowing harder it, it's like this it's like it's like a blowing sound and that, it's most strange it's coming from here and for the first couple of miles I was driving along pressing these buttons and I was adjusting this I was thinking what is going on here why 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 when I accelerate is my heater motor speeding up and then I realized I don't think it's the heater motor I think it's the turbo which is just the other side of the bulkhead I think it's actually the turbocharger is making a sort of a, a it's not a whistling sound it's almost like a sort of like an air blowing sound so I think there's something wrong with one of my hoses, one of my intercooler hoses. I think there's air leaking out somewhere. So what I'm going to do is plug in this. If you've never used one of these before, very easy to use. You just plug them into the socket underneath this socket here, which is the ODB2 port, which is very, very kind of common. It's like a sort of a standard diagnostics port to most modern cars have all you do is you plug that in these readers are very cheap this one was about 15 pounds on ebay lots of other different brands are available they all do the same thing some are more advanced than others but what you do is you plug it in and then you press enter to scan scan and it says waiting for the vehicle to respond. So what we have to do at that point is start the car up. Start the car. And then just see what it says. Oh, there we go. Codes found, one. Okay, so there's one code found. Right. Code. Read codes, enter. There you go, turbocharger or supercharger under boost. Well, we know that this car's a turbocharger, not a supercharger. It's under boost, okay? So we can actually clear the code and that will turn the engine, check engine light off again. Um, there's a little point in doing that because I'm sure it'll just come on again about half a mile down the road. So we'll leave that code there for now until I've investigated further. And then when I've found the cause and fixed it, I'll clear the code and we'll see if it comes back on again. Okay, 
So we can now just unplug that. So let's have a look in the engine bay and see where these hoses are. Okay, there are four intercooler hoses on this car. There is one down the bottom there. So let's have a look at which way the air comes in. So it comes in through the, uh, through the hole on the side of the wing, in there, down the duct, into the air filter box, across a duct here. Now you've probably got a black plastic duct here, possibly with those weird sort of bagpipe things sticking off it. I've replaced all of that with silicone and metal pipe. I found that the joint here was leaking a lot of oil. There's loads of oil coming down the back of the engine onto the hot turbo and making a, a right stink. So I replaced the whole lot. The car runs a lot better now. But let's carry on down here. So whatever duct you've got here, the air goes down and then there is a 90 degree elbow hose, which goes into the turbocharger. Okay, so the exhaust gas is coming out of the engine. Spin up the exhaust side of the turbocharger before going down the exhaust. And then the air coming in is compressed and that goes across underneath the car to another hose. I don't know if we can see it. Down there, not this one, that's a radiator hose, that one down there. Difficult to see it. You can just see there with the writing on it. And that goes through the intercooler at the front of the car. So underneath the radiator, so you've got the radiator and the air conditioning condenser. And there's also right down the bottom, down here somewhere, is an intercooler. Now, what is an intercooler? Well, it's a air to air heat exchanger. Why do you have one of those? It's because the turbocharger is compressing the air and that makes it get hot. Now, hot air contains less oxygen because it's less dense. So if you cool that air back down again by passing it through what is effectively a, a radiator, an air radiator, so the cool air coming in the front of the car cools that air down and then down, right down here somewhere, there is another rubber hose which goes across and up, up the front of the engine on a, uh, a sort of a black plastic duct and then there is a fourth hose which is very difficult to see but it is here. Fourth short almost straight hose which brings the air up to the throttle body which contains the butterfly valve which controls the airflow into the engine. Okay, so there are four hoses. You can buy a silicone replacement like this, either blue or black or any other color you like, which is a good idea because the factory hoses are not very strong. They, they just perish and split. Very, very common problem on a Freelander 2 is the, the factory intercooler hoses splitting. About four years ago, four or five years ago, I replaced the hose down here and the two hoses each side of the intercooler with blue silicone hoses like this. I didn't do this one. I didn't do this one. I just didn't get round to it. Now to do this one down here, You've got to sort of take this cover off. It's a lot easier trying to do it when you remove the throttle body as well. So I was sort of waiting really until I removed the throttle body next. The throttle body gears are made of plastic. They don't last very long, about 60,000 miles. If you ever hear a sort of scratching noise coming from here when you switch the engine off, it probably means that your gears are worn. So about every 60 to 100,000 miles, it's best to change the throttle body. It's very easy to change, just a few bolts and a few wires for sensors, you swap them over. And I did mine at about 60,000 miles and my car's now on 155,000. So I'm actually due to fit a third throttle body. So I was waiting until I did that before doing the hose. Now I've got a feeling 
that this hose down here, this fourth factory hose has split. Now it's very, very difficult to see. If we can have a look. Right, okay, I think I can see it. I'll try and reach in. Can you see here, there's, there's something, I'll try and get that to focus correctly. There's something here which looks like a split on that hose. Okay, I think that hose has, has failed. Now I'm hoping all the other hoses, the other three hoses are okay. What I'd like to do is put my car up on ramps and have a look at the other hoses, make sure that they're all okay. And then I'm gonna change this hose for a new, uh, well, new blue silicone one. I've got the fourth hose still from when I did the other three many years ago. So what I think's been happening is as I accelerated, the turbo tried to build up boost and the air was leaking out of that hose and the turbo was just spinning up and up and up, getting faster and faster and faster and not being able to build up the pressure, the manifold absolute pressure sensor here, which feeds back the boost to the computer, wasn't seeing the pressure build enough to tell the turbocharger to reduce or, or stop increasing the boost by adjusting the variable vanes inside the turbo. I'll be doing another video on the turbocharger another time, showing how, how it works, taking one apart and talking more about this variable, variable vane, variable geometry system that the turbocharger uses to, to limit the boost. So that could explain why I've heard, what, uh, uh, heard a sound that sort of was a bit like the heater blower being turned up. I think that was actually the turbocharger making that. The whistling noise that I've been hearing was probably the air seeping out of that split when it was very, very small. Now that it's got bigger, the air's just whooshing out of there and leaking really badly. When it was a little tiny pinhole, it probably made a, a squeaky whistling sound as the air seeped out. I've also noticed quite a bit of smoke out the back when I've accelerated or driven up steep hills. And that's probably because the airflow going into the engine was less because there was, there was less boost, less pressure, less oxygen going in. But of course the fueling was probably still the same. So the whole thing ran rich and ended up making a load of smoke. I, I don't know, I'm not totally sure what caused the smoke, but I can say there was a lot of smoke coming out the back. It was a sort of dark gray kind of smoke. It wasn't blue. So then it was burning oil and it wasn't white or steam or oil getting into the exhaust, which often makes white smoke. Uh, this, this was a sort of dark gray, black sooty smoke, which is what you would get if the engine was running too rich due to insufficient air or the air filter being blocked up or something like that. Okay, so, so all of these different symptoms are now starting to make sense. So what I'm going to do is change that hose and I'm going to inspect the other three hoses. Okay. And we'll see what state they're in. But what I will do is also show you the fitting of the other three hoses. I actually filmed that about four or five years ago. That was actually before I did YouTube. So I've got the video still. I just never got around to uploading them. I was going to wait until I did the fourth hose and then put it all together into one big video and upload that. Um, but uh, no time like the present. I might as well include it in this video so that you've got everything you need to know about changing your intercooler hoses. Okay, let's get the ramps out, get the car up and see what, uh, see what I can see. Okay, so I've put my car up on ramps and I've removed the factory engine lower tray, the underpan, that's over there. And I've also removed my Mantec sump guard as well. So now we can have a little look. It's pretty oily and horrible under here. 
that we can have a look and see. Now let's see if I can zoom out a bit. Okay, so let's have a little look, work out what goes where. So there at the back of the engine is the turbocharger. There is a duct up there, a rigid black plastic duct, which comes down from the air intake across the top of the engine into the compressor side, the intake side of the turbo, and then out bottom on this elbow here, which is actually a blue silicone hose, but it's got pretty muddy. Okay, so the standard hose is a black rubber one and can easily fail, a very common failure. So this hose here isn't actually that difficult to change because you can either reach up from here or you can just remove the inner wheel arch liner and get in through the side behind the wheel. So this one, people often say that this one is the most difficult. I actually found that the easiest. So then, after the turbo has compressed the air, it comes round on this metal duct here, this metal pipe, and then goes into this hose here, which goes up to the intercooler. Now, intercooler. Now this is also a blue silicone hose. I changed three of the hoses about five years ago. One thing to beware of is that this hose does go very close to the bodywork here. Okay, so you need to be a bit careful that that doesn't cut through the hose or rub. You might want to put another uh, metal clip or something around the hose or do something to just sort of protect it from that, that sort of bit of metal there because the edge, you can't really see it on this camera, but that edge there, that edge there is a bit sharp and it can actually cut through the hose. Okay, so to change this hose and this one, which is the one on the other side of the intercooler, you need to take the front bumper off the car. Okay, it's a little bit involved taking that off, although I have done a YouTube video showing how to do that. Okay, so it's just a case of undoing lots of different bolts and then the whole front comes off. And the reason you need to take the front off is to get to that clamp up there is very, very difficult. It's much, much easier with the front end off. Trying to do it this way is much more difficult. If you come in from the front, with the front bumper off, a lot easier. Now, I could probably actually get to this one because it's a Michelor clamp, but the standard clamps are sort of like jubilee clamps where you have to get a like a, a screwdriver or something on the end They're very very difficult to get at much easier with the front end off so that hose there goes into the intercooler comes out of the intercooler on the other side here this hose here you see moves about a bit now there is meant to be a sort of a plastic loop around it like a sort of retaining loop and what I found was it these silicone hoses were slightly too big and just didn't the, the, the hoop was kind of too small and in the slightly wrong position okay so I discarded it and didn't use it and then what I found was that this hose when it moved about and it swelled up with the turbo boost it was hitting this bolt head here on the end of this which is the air conditioning compressor and it actually started to wear it didn't go all the way through but it would have done had i not spotted it and i put this extra mickle or clamp here just as a protection there so that can then sort of hit against that it it's a bit of a workaround but it works there's no damage at all on that actually um it's lasted very well and protected the hose. So just something to be aware of. Now, another thing to be aware of is that these blue hoses, certain ones on eBay, such as these from Auto Silicone Hoses, um, 
and various other brands that are available on eBay, they seem to be a little bit too long where they go on to the intercooler up at this end. And what it means is that the hose is pushed back, sometimes even hitting the pulley here. So I've read quite a few reports of the hose being cut through by this pulley or it being pressed hard against these bolt heads and making holes in them. Okay, so you may need to trim the that end of this hose down slightly. I will show you that later in this video. So once the air has gone through the intercooler, it comes to here, and this is a black plastic duct that goes up to the throttle body. Okay, and there's another short hose up the top there. So that's the four intercooler hoses, two actually connected to the intercooler, and then one here on the turbo, and then one up to the top connecting to the throttle body. Okay, I hope that was useful to show you underneath the car and show you the hoses. What I'm going to do now is actually show you the video that I made five years ago when I fitted these three, okay, and show you how I fitted those and also I'll sort of list the clamp sizes that I used um, and, and also show you taking the bumper off and things like that. And then we'll move on to the fourth hose up the top there, okay. I'll show you how to change that one and, and also remove the throttle body as well. Okay. Video. Today we're going to be fitting new silicone intercooler hoses to a Land Rover Freelander 2. This is a 2009 diesel 2.2 .2 litre TD4 engine. These are the hoses I'm going to be fitting. I uh, bought these on eBay from a company uh, called DPH Sport. Um, the clips that I'm using, rather than use standard Jubilee clips, I've decided to buy these nice stainless steel nickel ore clips. Uh, quite expensive, but um, at least they won't rust. And they're also uh, a bit easier to use. You can clamp, clamp things up a bit tighter. Um, you can actually get a, get a socket on the end there rather than using a screwdriver. So let's have a look where these hoses actually attach underneath the car. So the, this hose here, the, the right angled small hose here, goes up the back of the engine, you can see there, underneath the turbocharger. This long hose here goes up over here. There's a metal pipe that joins onto that right angled hose and there you can see the rubber hose there going to the intercooler. This other long hose here, the one with the, uh, with the two bends on it, that goes up here on the other side, connecting to the other end of the turbo of, of the other end of the intercooler and connects onto this plastic duct here. I'm just about to see that. And then up the front of the engine we have this short hose here. body. So what we're going to do, the first hose that I'm going to fit is this one here, the one up below the turbocharger. So here we can see looking up from underneath at the hose that goes beneath the turbocharger, what we need to do is undo this clamp here and this one up here. It's quite inaccessible that one. Um, we may need to reach up above with a short screwdriver or use some sort of small spanner on it. Um, the, uh, the standard Land Rover clips here seem to take a 7mm a socket or a flat blade screwdriver. 
um, as well as undoing those two it's worth removing this nut here which is the bracket that mounts this uh, the rear mounting bracket for this metal pipe here so take that nut off there and to allow this pipe to drop so that we can actually get the hose off the turbocharger so having loosened off the two clamps on the hose and removed this nut here uh, from the uh, metal pipe bracket but unfortunately there's not enough movement to actually free it over the top of that stub so what I'm going to do as well is loosen off the front mount for the metal pipe as well okay it's a small nut a small bolt up there um, looks like a sort of 10 millimeter or something like that so I'll get a socket and loosen that one off so I've removed the bolt from the front mount it was a 10 millimeter socket required for that and that now allows this metal pipe to move quite a lot and should allow that now move round to the front of the car actually pull this pipe down with the rubber hose attached there we go that's now going like that and this hose can now be removed quite easily okay there's the small turbo hose removed with the clips removed notice that this clip here has some kind of teeth on it that uh, holds it onto the top of the, the hose yeah, and bottom one's just a standard tubular clip there this hose looks fine on my car although very frequently this hose splits so if you've got any kind of lack of power, hesitance, hissing noises anything like that check this hose so it does split quite easily this one actually looks to be pretty much okay I can't see any splits on it anywhere I'm going to replace that with our new hose here much nicer, stronger uh, clips. And when I put this on, I'll position it so that I can easily get to these to tie the clips because these ones were, were really difficult to get to. I've just manoeuvred the hose and the pipe up into position. Pop that bracket over the, uh, over the threaded stud there. Now, one thing that I found is trying to put the hose onto the end of the pipe with the clips in place uh, was quite difficult. Uh, I had to loosen the clips off to the point where they actually came apart. So what I'm going to do is put the clips on after as it's a lot easier to push the hose into position onto the bottom of the turbocharger um, without the clip in place. And put it onto the end of this metal pipe first um, here, get it to the same position that the old hose was and then offer the whole thing up into place and reach up push carefully push the other end of the hose onto the bottom of the table tray. reach up and feel all the way around make sure it's definitely located fully on um, once that's in position and this bracket here is, is back over the stud then you can actually just reach up and start fitting the clamps in place now the clamp at the top is 55 to 59 millimeter which is actually this one i just slipped down the other clamp is this one here which is a 51 to 55 millimeter um, that was the clamp which was the same size as the hose at the bottom However, when the hose has been fitted over the pipe, the metal pipe, uh, that clamp is possibly too small. It's right on the limit, really. I'll have a go at tightening it up, but um, I don't think I'm going to be able to put the clamp back together. Um, there's not enough thread on the end of the, the threaded rod. And it's actually looking like this one at the other end is, is suffering the same problem. It's not. That's that's right on the on the point where it's going to come apart 
and I can't actually get it get it far enough up. You see it needs to go a little bit further. Uh, if I loosen that off anymore it's going to come apart. So what I'm going to do is put that clamp at the bottom here and then a slightly larger clamp up at the top end. Okay, you can now see the hose in place with the two clamps. I've actually used the 55 to 59 millimeter clamp at this end and then up at the turbocharger end it's a 59 to 63 millimeter clamp. That gives a little bit of extra thread on the, uh, the, the clamp threaded rod uh, allowing the clamp to be easily sort of pushed up into position before tightening. So I'll now tighten those up. You can see the position of the clamps that we mentioned earlier. Uh, this one here you want the, the end pointing down so you can easily get a, get a, a socket up onto that and then this one here you can get a, get a, a ratchet up onto that one quite easily. Tighten those up nicely. Don't forget to fit this, uh, this nut here as well. That hose is now in place and the clamps are tightened up. So now we can move on to the other hoses. Right, now I'm going to try and fit the other three hoses. The best way to do this is to remove the front bumper from the car. Looks a bit daunting, sounds a bit scary, but uh, it shouldn't be too difficult. There are other videos available on YouTube which show the exact procedure. And very roughly, there's some bolts up here, four bolts there. There are some bolts down in here, there's a screw there, a couple of bolts here and then some other screws underneath here. There and there. Remove all of those and the headlights and towing eye cover underneath there and then the whole front end comes away in one piece. You just have to disconnect the headlights, or the fog lights rather, disconnect the fog lights and the washer fluid, washer fluid hoses. Okay, now ready to remove the front. So I've removed these four bolts here, apart from one. Best to leave that one until the last minute, just to stop the whole front end coming crashing down on you. Headlights out. Up in the wheel arches, remove the two nuts at the back. They're plastic nuts, they have a habit of spinning on the metal studs. Put a WD-40, make sure the thread is clear, and if necessary, just pull them off with pliers. Inner wheel arch liner then comes out. In this example here, this one, this, uh, the other side came out fine, this one. There's one screw at the bottom that has, I haven't been able to undo. So that screw there, I can't undo. So I'm just gonna leave that so the wheel arch line will come away with, with the front bumper. So that screws out, same on the other side. And then there are two bolts here, same on the other side. <coughs> Underneath, remove the towing eye cover and the two bolts that attach bottom of the bumper and then up in here there's a Torx T30 Torx screw pull that back and then up in here is it's very very inaccessible very difficult to get to there is just here a another bolt and you have to get to that thing okay, up under here on both sides. Very, very difficult to get to. That was the only one that was really difficult to get to. This wheel arch liner doesn't come out. You just pull that back, pull that back. Okay. All the bolts were a 10 millimeter socket, and the screws were just cross head screws, or for the ones in the wheel arch. Well, arches, they were uh, they were T30 Torx, although the screw heads do allow a flat-bladed screwdriver to work as well. So what I'm going to do now 
is remove this last bolt here, pop the front end over this little catch and try and lift the front off the car. I've now lifted the front end away, it's quite straightforward, remove that last bolt at the top, lift the whole thing off the car. It's connected by headlight washer hoses and this connector here which uh, does the parking sensors and the fog lights if you've got them fitted. Just push that red thing back, press there, pull, pull the bottom half away. So the front end is now sitting there. I need to disconnect the washer hoses now. A uh, little tip is to disconnect the two hoses and join one back to the other to minimise fluid, fluid leakage. So I'll disconnect this one here and this one here and connect that, that hose back up over to here. Let's try that now. Front end is now ready to move out of the way. You'll notice the inner wheel arch is still attached on this side because I couldn't remove the screw. It was rusted solid and was starting to round off, so I just left it as it was. Now that the front end's off, you can easily get to the clips for the intercooler hoses. Here's one here on the off side, and then over on the near side. those and then pull the hoses out underneath. So I've undone this front clip here and the hose now we pull the way there. Underneath this bolt here has been removed from the bracket to allow this pipe to move slightly and undone this hose clamp here to allow this hose to be removed. Here we can see the old hose, there's a lot of oil on it, which suggests that there was a leak somewhere, although I can't see a split in it anywhere. And here's the new one we're going to be putting in its place. I fitted the hose, I had to use a normal Jubilee clip in the end. The 68-73mm Michelor clip that I had was too small. I really need the next size up. So a uh, clamp that will go up to about 80 millimetres. Now we can see the new hose in position with the Michelor clamp at this end, 59 to 63 millimetre. The other end needed a Jubilee clip as the Michelor clamp I have is too small. The bracket bolt up there has now been replaced. So that hose is done. We can move on to the other hose on the other side, you can see here a bit of oil at that end indicating that uh, possibly there's a leak on that hose somewhere. On this side, the off side, you can see here the clamp here at the front, so I'm going to undo that okay. and then do the clamp at the other end and uh, I'll remove this hose. Once the two hose clips are undone and this plastic support bracket has been undone from the front up here with a small Torx screw then you can actually maneuver the whole hose down and out underneath right there it is right here's the hose I've just removed again no sign of any splits, although there is quite a lot of oil. There's actually oil dripping out of the hose. 
a lot of oil on the outside. Mostly at the, the lower end here. Um, although I can't actually see any splits or tears in the hose. Okay, there's the old hose and there's the new hose that I'm going to be fitting. Now I've heard uh, a few stories of people fitting these and having problems with the air conditioning compressor pulley wearing through the back of the hose because the hose has been too close. So I'm just going to offer that up. You can see the new hose is uh, a little bit longer, a little bit longer than the old one. Um, slightly different shape actually. That needs to be pulled over. Um, so um, there's a possibility you might have to trim this down slightly, but uh, we'll see. I'll fit it and see how close it is. Right, I've just fitted the new hose roughly in position here. It's a bit of a job actually, more difficult than the other two hoses we've already done. Um, the plastic support ring, this one, which came off the old hose, is too small. Can't be opened out or adjusted, so I'm going to have to do something different. Uh, there's also not a lot of clearance between the power steering pulley, or the, sorry, the air conditioning pulley and the hose. Um, that's a little bit, that's about five millimeters, that's too close for my liking, so I'm going to remove the hose again and trim the end down the big end where it meets the intercooler. So I've actually cut off about 20 millimeters from the end of that hose so that the, uh, the back of the hose is a little bit further away from the air conditioning compressor pulley. I don't want it uh, wearing through because we're real problems. Right, this third hose has now been fitted. After trimming down about 20 millimetres off this end, put a stamped Jubilee clip there because the Michelob clamp I have is too small. It needs to be about 70 to 80 millimetres diameter. We just have a quick look underneath. You can see here, there's now a good 30 millimetres, 25 to 30 millimetres clearance between the, uh, the pulley and the hose. It also clears these, these sort of bolts on the underside of the air conditioning compressor. And there's a 63 to 68 millimetre diameter Michelor clamp there. Fitted the Michelor clamp now to the front intercooler hose. I originally had to use a Jubilee clip like this one, the standard kind of clip that was on before. Uh, I was never too happy with that, so this is a nice stainless steel Michelor. Both ends of the intercooler are a 73 to 79 millimeter Michelor. There's one. The other one is there, 73 to 79, and then underneath we've got a 59 to 63 on the other end of the near side, UK passenger side intercooler hose, so it's a 59 to 63. And then the other end of the offside UK driver's side is a 63 to 68 millimeter. Just be very careful of this. I've put another Michelor clamp on there just as protection because that was actually wearing a hole through the side of the hose. This bolt head on the bottom of the uh, on the front of the, the air conditioning compressor so I put that there as protection there are also a few other places which give me some concern and that is here hose is touching the chassis there it's not actually not worn through but there is a mark on the hose, so that's something to watch. And same 
at the other end here. There is another mark on the hose there, which uh, could well wear through at some point. It's a shame that these, uh, these silicon hoses don't uh, don't fit as well as I'd expect. Okay, so now I'm going to change this hose down in here for this one here. Okay, so this was bought on eBay by DPH Sport. I think the the company that sell these is called Auto Silicone Hoses, and they usually sell the four hoses either as a kit of four or as two pairs. So this one comes with one of the two intercooler hoses at the front, and then the other one comes with the elbow from down in there. So this is the fourth hose. This goes up the front of the engine from a black plastic duct, a rigid duct, and joins that to the bottom of the throttle body here. So what I'm going to do is to remove this cover. So there's just a couple of bolts here. Um, on your cover here, there will be a stud sticking up at the back. I've removed that when I fitted these silicone hoses here, so I'll just slide that out, but you might need to kind of wiggle your top engine cover out from underneath the duct. If you really can't get it out, then you might have to even remove the duct to sort of just get that out. It's a bit fiddly. But once this is removed, we can get at the locating bolts that, that secure the throttle body to the, the intake manifold and should get a bit of a clearer picture as to what's going on down in there and then remove the throttle body unplug the sensors there's a couple of sensors there's the manifold absolute pressure sensor this this one here and there's also i think an air temperature sensor and possibly one other sensor as well it's probably actually the wiring the wiring for the motor in the throttle body that i'm thinking of there's there's three things that need disconnecting from what i remember from when i did the throttle body before Okay, right, let me get this cover off and then we'll have a look at the throttle body underneath. So the two bolts securing the engine cover are an eight millimeter socket. Undo those, the other one's over here. And then the cover just sort of pops off. Once the two bolts have been removed from this cover, it's just a case of pulling it up. It just kind of pops off. So that just comes up. Let's see if we can get this one out. I don't really want to have to undo my ducting. Your engine cover will probably be just as fiddly, even with these ducts here and the, the spigot thing removed from the back there. It's still difficult freeing up that corner. Uh, it's just a case of kind of like tipping it and wiggling it out like that. Okay, there we go, got it free eventually. So you can see there where I've cut the stud off the back of that cover. As standard, there's a stud sticking up there, but I had to cut that one off because I didn't want it to make a hole in my nice blue silicone hoses. Put that there. Right. Okay, what have we got now? It's all a bit grimy and dirty, but nothing too alarming is jumping out there. There's no sort of leaking fuel or with obvious holes in or anything like that. So this is the fuel filter here. There is a small electric pump in the fuel tank at the back of the car to lift the fuel over the hump, over the prop shaft. 
it doesn't actually pump the fuel to the front of the car, it's the suction from the high pressure pump, which is on the end of the camshaft, uh, I forget which end, one end of the camshaft, camshaft uh, one of the camshafts anyway, and um, fuel is then comes round through the filter, I don't know if it goes through the filter and then through the pump, I'm not sure, I'm not sure, but it goes through the filter and then there is a return fuel line here, you can see this arrow here, fuel that wasn't injected into the engine goes back off to the tank. Okay, so this metal tube here is the common rail fuel delivery tube and then you've got these high pressure fuel lines, metal pipes, because the, the diesel is injected at very, very high pressure. They take the fuel down to the injectors which are these green green things here okay so there is a fuel pressure sensor here and then there is a I think that's a fuel pressure relief valve at that end which yeah that that end opens and, and when the pressure reaches a certain amount in the fuel line that opens and then spare fuel goes off back round uh, and back to the tank. Now it doesn't go back through the filter. You might be wondering why that pipe doesn't just go straight off to the back. It's because when the engine is cold, fuel is recirculated the short trip. So it kind of goes straight back round. So the fuel warms up quicker. It's only once the engine is heated up that the fuel goes all the way back to the tank. There's a thermostatic valve in the fuel fuel uh, filter here. On cheap fuel filters, that valve can go wrong. And what happens then is the, fi the fuel circulates forever and gets hotter and hotter and hotter. And then the engine will go into limp mode or there'll be some kind of fault. Something goes wrong. So if you ever have an issue where your car starts fine and 10 miles down the road it goes wrong, check your fuel filter. Even if it's brand new, you might have fitted one of the cheap ones with the th faulty thermostatic valve in. Okay. Anyway, that's, that's one of the issues. I just thought I'd throw that info in. That can go wrong. But anyway, we're looking at intercooler hoses. So I've removed the top cover and don't seem to be any closer to finding that hose which is down there somewhere so what i need to do here is i need to remove uh it's it's not actually this bit it's the bit lower down let's see yeah, this is this bit here isn't the throttle body, okay? It, the throttle body's down there and the hose is below that. So it is a little bit fiddly to get to. You might be wondering what this weird fabric kind of hose here is. That's a metal pipe with a, with a sort of heat proof, um, kind of heat proof fabric cover, coating on it. That is the exhaust gas recirculation pipe, okay? So in order to reduce emissions as standard, the car will feed an amount of exhaust gas back round into the inlet to be reburned. Keeps the combustion temperatures down and it stops horrible nitrous oxides and things being created uh, and pumped out of the exhaust. It's purely for pollution and emissions reasons. I blocked mine off here with a blanking plate. Okay, and it did make the engine run a bit smoother. It improved the low end, the low end sort of torque. So um, there's another video on that. It's actually my most popular YouTube video. It's got something like 60,000 views already. Um, a lot of people want to do exhaust gas recirculation blanking plate. Be aware that on the later models with the DPF, the diesel particulate filter, they have a sensor in, I think, the, the, the exhaust gas recirculation valve, which is at the other end. They, they do something. I think there's a sensor, pressure sensor. So if you block this completely, it detects that and it, and it throws an error and puts the car in limp mode. So you need a plate with a little hole in it just to allow a little tiny bit of gas through just to um, avoid that pressure sensor tripping. So this is an older model, no DPF, so I fitted the full blanking plate and it works very well, it's been on there for years.
six, seven years, but no issues at all. No issues with the MOT either. Same was through the emissions test. So, I wonder if there's anything else here that's worth pointing out while we've got the top of the engine off. The fuel filter, source gas recirculation of throttle body, fuel rail, injectors. All this wiring here is for the sensors and the injectors. This pipe here is for the crankcase gas, okay, so where the dipstick goes into the bottom of the engine, uh, there is actually a sort of a oil strainer on the front of the engine and any gas that gets up from the bottom of the engine that's gone past the piston rings will come up here and then go through the top of the crank case there and then go through the PCV valve which is designed to open when the crank pressure builds and I've put it to catch can here okay as standard the pipe comes up and straight into the inlet that's a whole nother video as standard it will be reburning all of that oily fumy rubbish that comes out the bottom of the engine I've put mine to a catch can that then vents to atmosphere I want nice clean air going into my engine okay not smoke and fumes and oxygen that's already been burnt so there's a, a, another video on this duct talking about the catch can. Right, what I'm going to do now, pop this hose, try and push this hose out of the way somehow. Try and see how on earth I get down to this. So this connector here is the connector which feeds the motor for the throttle body. It, it's not a mechanical linkage like a cable to the accelerator or anything like that. It's a, it's a motor with a feedback resistor, variable resistor, basically a servo, and the throttle pedal is electronic, so that just has a variable resistor on it and that sends a signal at varying voltage to the ECU to say, I want to go faster, and the ECU opens up the throttle valve unless it decides that it's snowy or icy or you're in deep mud or off-road or something else where it won't obey the throttle pedal and it will either not open the throttle or open it slowly or if you're in sand mode it'll open it quickly because you want very rapid throttle response in sand to dig your way out of the sand keep the vehicle momentum up so that's how the electronic throttle works i'm going to disconnect this manifold absolute pressure sensor i'm going to disconnect this and i'm going to look for the other sensor there is another sensor somewhere and it's an air temperature sensor i can't see it it is down down here just down it's it's below this it's down there that needs disconnecting as well why am I removing the throttle body? Why am I not just reaching down and doing the hose? Well, when I did the throttle body before, when I replaced the throttle body before, I drove up the road and after half a mile there was a, a terrible sound. There was a whooshing sound and the car was lurching and really not running very happily at all. And what had happened is that hose had popped off the throttle body so I put the new throttle body on and then that hose had come off and I just couldn't get it back on properly I couldn't get it back on enough to tighten the clamps up properly and what I did is I removed the throttle body again stuck that in the hose and then bolted that in it was a lot easier a lot easier so I'm going to try and do it that way this time with the throttle body out of the way Easier to get to that. There's the hose underneath it. And this is the throttle body. A lot easier to get in there. Put the hose on. Plug it into the throttle body pipe, and then bolt that back in. Right. Okay. I'm gonna have a go at that and see how I get on. Okay, so what I've done here is I've just tied this radiator hose up to the dipstick handle there just to kind of hold that up out of the way. 
makes life a little bit easier because you can see what you're doing now. Next thing, let's disconnect the manifold absolute pressure sensor. It's still fiddly getting in here. But you need to pull up this tab here. It's, you don't press it down, you, you pull it up. And that allows that to unplug. Let's cut this cable tie here very carefully. So it's not to go through the wire. Disconnect the throttle body motor somehow. Oh, I don't know. All these connectors have little tabs on them. Some you press, some you pull, some you have to slide. Each one's different. Oh, I, don't, I think I need to lift that one. Right, I'll have to get a small screwdriver or something in there. And I'm going to have to actually remove this manifold absolute pressure sensor completely because one of the bolt heads that we need is underneath it and it's actually a, I think it's a Torx screwdriver. It's not a spanner, it's not a, not a hex head, it's a, uh, you've actually got to get a screwdriver into it. So this will have to come out of the way. Right, let me get some more tools out. I've just found something that makes life a lot easier. This hook for the radiator hose actually slides out, it lifts up a bit fiddly, and it comes out. Okay, it's just a slide fit, and that then gives us a lot more access. Let's put that somewhere safe. Right, that's a bit easier. I can actually get in there now. Somebody at Land Rover was thinking. Right, so, Torx T30, manifold absolute pressure sensor retaining screw. Be careful I don't drop that. Right, there it is. Just really didn't want to drop that down underneath the engine. So, let's see if that sensor comes free now. Come on. Come on, come on. There it is. It is. It's got a rubber O-ring on there. Okay, just pull it out. So there we go, three wire manifold absolute pressure sensor. The way this works is it has zero volts, a five volt, stable five volt reference and then the other pin is a signal wire that gives about 0.5 to 4.5 volts, depending on the vacuum or boost. Depending on the vacuum or boost that is in the, the intake. Okay. If you've got issues with your Freelander 2 where it's just sort of not running right and you think the mixture is wrong and things like that, it's worth either cleaning this up or replacing it. It does a lot, this sensor, because that, that controls the turbo, the, the vanes in the turbo, this and other sensors such as fuel pressure, feedback to the ECU, about the mixture, the fueling, how much fuel to inject, everything everything really. Without that, your car's not gonna run very well at all. Right, so we can see here now, that's the screw hole. That hole there is where the O-ring went. And that goes down into the sort of throat of the, um, well, it's the part of the intake manifold. It's this elbow bit, which links up with the intake manifold. So we can now see this screw here which is one of the three screws that holds the throttle body on. The other two are, there's one down there. Let's get that out of the way. There's the other one. And there is another 
that it's round here. You can just see it. Where is it? Very difficult to focus, but it's somewhere, somewhere down in there. You can't really see it. There it is. Yeah, it's 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 down in here, down there between those two fuel lines. Okay. So you've got to undo all three of those. And then the throttle body should drop away. There is one other sensor, which is a temperature sensor, which I might just have to unplug when the throttle body drops down. Can't actually see the wiring for it. Yeah, it's, it's down in there. It's that one down in there. So it's going to be difficult to get to. I'll unplug that as the throttle body falls away. Right, I'm going to undo those three bolts, three screws. I'm pretty sure they're the same as the sensor screw. Uh, yep, yeah, there we go, T30. Okay, so Torx T30, quite tight. Okay, so I'm going to do those three now, take them out carefully, and then drop the throttle body away. It's still attached to the split hose underneath it. Right, so I've removed this screw here. That is quite a long Torx T30. It's longer than the one that was holding the sensor on. Okay. And I've also removed the one at the back there and I've loosened off the one that's down in there. The one thing I've noticed, if you can see that, try and zoom in, see if I can get that to focus. There we go. You can see that it's not a hole, it's a slot. Okay, so there is a sort of a cutout bit at the back here. And the great thing about that is it means that the two, the two screws at the back here, you actually only have to loosen them off. I've already taken that one out and I didn't, I didn't realize there was a, a slot until I'd removed it. The one there, down in there, you really can't see, it's down in there. I've just loosened, okay. And if we slide the throttle body backwards slightly towards the engine, it actually comes free. Oh, I still haven't disconnected this um, motor connector. Right, I need to get a screwdriver and disconnect that. And I need to also disconnect this temperature sensor. Um, but you can now see the throttle body has come adrift there. And the screw at the back is still located now. I will retrieve that ASAP because I don't want it to come completely loose and fall down in and end up down in the intercooler or something crazy. So any loose bolts, always best to lift them up out of the way and put them somewhere safe like this. I might actually try and invent some kind of tool tray that sits here. I think that would be really useful because I end up just scattering tools and nuts and bolts along here. The amount of times I've dropped them down in and they've gone right down under the engine and because I've got a Mantec sump guard it's a right game getting them back out again to get the car on ramps and take the sump guard off and and the factory pan as well it's a real real job so um right let me let me just get these connectors disconnected and then we'll be able to pull that fully away and have a good look at it Okay, so the way to remove this throttle body motor connector is just to get a little screwdriver there, just pop the barb, and then and that should allow the connector to come free. There we go. Okay, so there's that connector. And then this temperature sensor one here, you just have to do the same thing. You just lift the barb and then push carefully push the connector down, don't pull on the wires, but just push that down. Okay, so that's all of the electrical connections to the throttle body completely disconnected. The throttle body is now free from the intake manifold. Um, it can't go anywhere though, because it's still attached to that hose underneath. So 
you can see there, this thing here, that's a little thermistor. Um, yeah, it's an optional thermistor there, which is the air intake temperature sensor. Not to be confused with this thing here, that's the mass airflow sensor. So that's actually got a temperature sensor and a hot wire kind of set up inside it. But that's for measuring the air flow, not the air temperature. Okay, this one down here measures the air temperature. I think, yeah, it's only got two connections. So, so that is literally just a little sort of like a thermistor, it's not a thermocouple, I don't think it's just a thermistor there, which is just a resistor which changes its resistance depending on the temperature. Okay, so what I need to do now, this is very difficult to see, but you see there's a Jubilee clip there. I need to undo that. Okay, and that's what holds the throttle body onto the hose. And when that's disconnected, or loosened off, I can lift the whole throttle body out. We can then get at the hose below and undo that and remove that and swap it for a nice shiny blue hose. Okay, so what I've done is retrieved that third throttle body mounting bolt. I've just removed that fully just so that it doesn't fall down the bottom under the engine or worse, go into the, into the, uh, into the intake duct of the hose and end up down in the bottom of the intercooler. Let's put that with the others. And I've also undone my Jubilee clip that was holding that hose on. So that throttle body now, you can see, is actually now free of the hose and it's completely disconnected from everything. So I've got to try to wiggle that out. Okay, so there we go. There we go. That's the throttle body. If you need to change your throttle body because the plastic gears inside there have stripped which is a very common fault okay now the later ones of these did have slightly stronger gears you can actually get a metal gear replacement kit um, on ebay but the problem with that is it has to be glued in on top of the gears and i've heard stories of people doing that and then after a couple of weeks the glue failed and the metal gears just fell off um, if you have any weird scratchy noises or lumpy kind of idle or the engine not shutting down cleanly if it sort of splutters to a halt rather than cutting off cleanly it's worth changing this throttle body these are a hundred quid online on ebay or other sites you get the whole thing and this is what you have to do if you want to change it now i'm going to be refitting this one because it's working fine i haven't got any issues I'm going to refit this, I'm just going to give it a bit of a clean up and then refit this. It's the hose that I want to change today. But if you do want to change your throttle body, if your car has done over about sort of 70, 80,000 miles and you are on the original throttle body, strongly consider renewing that. They do fail after, a, after about sort of 60 to 100,000 miles of use. Just showing you what's going on in here, we've got a metal butterfly okay so there is a metal butterfly it's on a very strong spring so don't stick your fingers down in there too much they'll get sliced off um in here there is a motor with feedback resistor and some gearing and it's the gearing that fails the gearing that fails the plastic gears are the weak point on this whole thing and it seems such a shame to replace the whole nice metal throttle body when all of it is fine apart from the gears. It's not the motor or any of the wiring that goes wrong, it's the gears that wear the teeth. This little sensor here, worth giving that a clean up actually, it doesn't look too bad, but if that gets coated in oily gunk, especially if you're running the standard duct here with all the fumes and oil coming up from the engine back in, it's after the air filter, the air filter's there, so it's not gonna get caught at all, it's just going to get all the way around and into your engine and it's going to coat this sensor and probably get up into your manifold absolute pressure sensor as well, go up that little hole there 
Um, but certainly this one here, if that gets a layer of black grime and oil all over it, it's not going to measure the temperature correctly. So your car's then going to be running with the wrong mixture because the ECU thinks the air outside is warmer or colder than it is and it's going to inject the wrong amount of fuel. So it's all these little things which when people sort of say, oh, why did you bother going to all the trouble of changing that duct? Seems like a lot of work just to avoid putting some fumes into the engine. It's things like this that people forget about. Okay, so all in all, this one's actually pretty clean. No surprises because I'm not putting the oil and grot back into the engine. If I looked at one of these from a factory standard vehicle that was feeding the engine fumes, the blow by gas back in, I expect it will be a lot dirtier. Okay, probably with a crusty layer of black carbon and God knows what all over the inside of that. I'll put up a quick picture now of a bad example to show you what things can look like. Now this one actually looks nice and clean, so I'm going to just refit that. We can now see the offending article. Okay, so let's just take that clip off there to avoid dropping it down in. I can't remove it, it's one of these ones that's clipped on the side. Okay, so I've got to remove the other Jubilee clip now at the bottom, or loosen it, and then that can come out. And you can clearly see, let's see let's the camera in there. there we go, there's a split. So that's why there's no boost. That's why we've got whistling noises and whirring noises. That's why we've got smoke out the back. And that's probably why my 0 to 60 time, or my my 30 to 70 acceleration test time that I did in recent videos was about 20 seconds, 18 to 20 seconds uh, in my K&N video. And I had a few people comment saying, oh, that's a bit slow, my car does it in 12 seconds. Okay, well, yeah, now I know why my car was so slow. It just wasn't building up a decent bit of boost from the turbo. So it'd be very interesting for me to retry that acceleration test with the new Hogue and see if it's any faster. Right. It's free. Very, very fiddly. Very, very messy job. And there's so much oily crap down there. And I don't know where that's come from because I'm not putting any oil into the intake. It wasn't inside the hose. The hose actually clean as a whistle inside. It's on the outside, I don't know if this is just road grime that's come through the front grille or maybe it's just oil from years ago when I was running the factory duct. But um, yeah, that's came off. The other clip unfortunately fell down under the engine. It had to happen at some point. So, where's that split? There we go. A big, big split. And I think that started off as a tiny pinhole and made a whistly noise, and then started opening up and spreading and turned into a sort of whooshing kind of sound. And I don't know, maybe the, it was the turbo spinning up to crazy speed that I could hear. Maybe it was the air coming out of this. There was a definite whooshing sound from the engine. So I'm going to go and get cleaned up now. This hose is going to go in the bin. These clips are probably also going to go in the bin. I'm going to be using Michelor clamps on the new hose. Okay, so there's the new hose over there. I'm going to be using these nice stainless steel. These are W4, so Michelor clamps are available in uh, W2 and W4, both stainless. Uh, you can probably get regular steel ones as well, but uh, W two is just mild sort of grade stainless steel w4 is marine grade okay so it's gonna last forever so um all that road salt and everything else won't start to attack them right it's off time to get cleaned up and start reassembling i'm just giving the throttle body a bit of a clean up this is actually brake and parts cleaner should really use proper carburetor cleaner or throttle body cleaner. 
I'm sure it's the same kind of stuff. I don't know what it is, xylene, toluene, naphtha or something like that. Um, it's just a degreaser. I'm sure this will work just as well. Let's give that a bit of a, a, bit of a clean. Get rid of some of the uh, grime that's on there. And also make sure that the butterfly inside is spotlessly clean. Yeah, there we go. And most importantly, that that temperature sensor is completely degreased and spotlessly clean because that will um, that controls the fueling it's one of the sensors that the ECU uses to work out the right amount of fuel to put in so very important that that is reading correctly right I'll just leave that there in the sunshine to dry what I need to do now is get this new blue hose and fit that on to the end this, of this black plastic duct there that comes up from the other intercooler hose up the top here. Okay, so that plastic duct actually looks like it's got a metal insert, a sort of like a metal ring inside it to stop it getting crushed when you tighten up the clamp. Now I'm going to use Michelor clamps on this hose here because they're much better than Jubilee clips. They don't cut into the hose, they also are a lot more secure and they are made of marine grade stainless steel as well so they won't rust. Okay so here are the Michelor clamps that I'm going to be using on this new short silicone hose. These are 63 to 68. These are actually W2. I thought I had some W4 grade clips in this size. These ones here, these bigger ones are W4. These are W2, so they're still stainless steel, but they're not just, not quite as uh, stainless as the marine grade, but never mind, it'll do for now. Um, you can always swap them later on if they start to show any signs of corrosion. 63 to 68 millimeter diameter. I've loosened these off as much as I dare before they spring apart. And what I'm going to do is the throttle body, which is now spotlessly clean. I'm going to pop that in one end of the hose. I don't actually think it matters which and it goes on. This hose is the same diameter at each end and it's just got a slight bend in it so it can go that way but I think I think it sits like that with the inside of the bend towards the engine. I might be wrong. No, actually no, I am wrong. That that pipe there's at quite an angle, so it will sit like that with the the inside towards the radiator. Okay, so the throttle body then goes like that. The motor casing was on this side, the air filter box side. Okay, so that has to go like that. So what I'm gonna do is push that in now, stick one of the clamps on, tighten it up pretty tight. Okay, I don't want this hose popping off down in. Okay, so that's fully in. Get the clamp up and tighten that off whilst it's sort of here on the bench like this before actually fitting it to the car. And then I'll insert the other clamp on there, get that down onto the rigid pipe and tighten the other clamp up. That way there's only one clamp to do up when it's down in position. Okay, so that hose is on there, that sits like that. That clamp there is nice and tight. This lower clamp is loose. I've just pushed it onto there so that I can then fit that down and get it over that black duct 
down there and then slide the clamp down. Now it's worth mentioning here that the ends of the metal pipe that this silicone hose goes over and the end of that black plastic one are sort of have a little lip, a kind of like a barb on the end of them, like a rim around. And these clips, whilst that clip did go over that, it was very tight, so I had to loosen it sort of right off like this. It was almost springing apart. Um, but I think that is the right size of clip. That one's now tightened up and there's a sensible amount of thread that's come through. So it's just, I just thought I'd mention that, that it's uh, a little bit difficult getting this over the lip on the pipe once the hose is on. You might find it easier to actually slide that down so it's ready and then push it down with the clip on the end of the pipe already, on the end of the hose. Um, you'll, you'll have to just figure it out. Right, I'm gonna try and offer that up now. What I'm gonna do is, before I do that, is I'm gonna take two of these bolts that located the throttle body and I'm just going to try to do this so you can see. I'm just going to loosely put them into here because it's easier to locate these with these bolts just loosely in because this bit's a uh, cut out there we can actually put this bolt in loose and then put the throttle body in under and up and locate okay easier easier to do that than to try and get these in down through here because uh, you're just going to end up dropping them down in, underneath the engine. The front one is a hole. Okay, so that one has to be inserted afterwards. Okay, here's a quick tip. I've just tried to offer this up and I couldn't get access to the Michelor clips from this side. So I've just removed it again and I've just turned them around so that the bolt heads are on this side the UK passenger side so that when that's fitted all I have to do is then go in here with a screwdriver and a 10 millimeter socket and do it up much easier than rummaging down in this lot trying to kind of get in there with a, with a socket and a ratchet or something right and try again this one's tight that one's very loose as loose as it can possibly go and get that over the end of the duct and then we can tighten everything up okay so here's another tip when you get the bottom of the hose over the end of the black plastic duct and you have to reach down grab the duct with one hand and push the blue hose and the throttle body down onto it with your other hand get the Michelor clip down when it's roughly in position insert this extra screw here make sure that the other two behind are just located but insert that and tighten it a little bit not right up it just holds the throttle body into in position okay otherwise when you're trying to kind of wrestle getting that Michelor clip down the, the throttle body could just keep dropping down but with that screw in it'll stay there and it allows you to then pull the black plastic duct up and push down on that Michelor clamp now these Michelor clamps are just loose enough to slide over the, the sort of rim at the end of the black plastic duct. It's, it's a struggle. I would recommend possibly going to the next size up to make life a, life a little bit easier, but, uh, but it's, it's there. I just need to work that down a little bit more. It's got to get down to position. I can feel the, 
black plastic duct has gone quite far up into the blue hose. It only needs to go about, about three centimeters, just enough to allow the Michelor clamp to get over that, that sort of barbed kind of rim on the edge, edge of the edge of the hose. Right, I'm just gonna get that in position and then I'm gonna reach down and use a screwdriver with a socket on the end of that to tighten that mickle or clamp up. I need to make sure they're nice and tight. I don't want them coming loose, popping the hose off. Okay, the mickle or clamps are now tight. So you can see there, there's the clamp. It actually could go a little lower, but you can see this little bulge here. There's a sort of small bulge here. That's where the top of that black plastic duct is. So it's gone quite far up there. I'm worried that that's a bit close to the uh, starter motor, but, uh, but that, that is actually up mated against there. So I think that's fine. That's fine. I can always pull that black duct down a bit and move the clamp down, but I'll, I'll, I'll run with that. We'll, we'll see how we get on. That's, um, that's there. So now I can tighten up this one and the other two. Okay, and then I'll just check clearances and just see how it feels. I'll just loosen the mickle or clamp a bit and just move everything down slightly. All right, let's get into the other one. There's probably a torque rating for these bolts in the Haynes manual. I'm just gonna do it up tight by hand. This one's a bit of a pain because it's certainly with this driver, it, the fuel hose is in the way. I might possibly try and get an extension bar with the ratchet. Just too short. Okay, let me sort out a quick uh, extension bar down in there. And then I can, the next thing to do is reconnect all of these connectors refit the manifold absolute pressure sensor. I'll put another cable tie on here just to hold this wiring. And then I can start the engine, see if it's any better. Okay, those bolts are all pretty tight now. I've just noticed that this uh, screwdriver actually got a socket in the top, which is quite nice. You can actually stick a uh, ratchet in there, just to make sure these are nice and tight. Three of these, the Michelor clamps. A tight two. I've just I decided to move this clamp and the black duct down very slightly because I was a bit worried about the clearance between the duct and the starter motor, but that is that's still against the starter motor. I don't think it will cause a problem because this is tough black plastic it's not not a silicone hose but um yeah if that goes down any more the, the lip is there i can feel it if that goes down any more this clamp's going to be right on the end of the, the hose so yeah just something to watch the clearance there you can hear that tapping but it in a way it's kind of good because it kind of holds it all pretty solid right throttle body's in now what uh okay let's refit this sensor I think before I do that, I'm just going to reconnect. Uh, let's have a look. Yeah, let's reconnect there. I'll do it in the, the opposite order. All right, there's a click there. So that's the motor connector. And then there is this one which loops back underneath. Right, that's the motor connector. This connector here. This connector here, which is for the air temperature sensor, was very, very difficult and fiddly to get back on because there's all this stuff in the way here. You can't really, you just can't get in. I, it took me a while to get it lined up. 
And then when I pushed it on, the barb here pointed it with a screwdriver here. So this barb here, you've got to make sure that that clicks, okay? So every time I thought it was in, is I'd just test it by carefully just pushing down and it would come off again, okay? So in the end, I kind of got the screwdriver at a bit of an angle like this, through there, like that, and lifted it, and lifted it and it clicked, okay? And then it wouldn't move down, so I know it clicked in. So it took probably a good five minutes to get that connector connected on again. Um, maybe it would have been better to have connected that up when I was lifting, lifting the, the throttle body into position whilst I still had full access to it. Anyway, it's on now, but I just thought I'd mention that. Let's get this pressure sensor on. Don't think I need to clean this. I'm wondering, there's a bit of grime in. Yeah, there's a little bit of dirt in the hole there, but I've just got rid of that. Right. Make sure that the mating surface there is clean. I don't think that's really clean, really. Mm, it does go in with an O-ring, though, so what we're looking for is push that in. Come on, go in there. No, it wasn't in properly. Right, that is now in properly. Now I need to put the screw in. I'm sure it would have pushed itself in as I tightened the screw, but it just needed to kind of like locate properly. So, right, there's the screw for that. Right, I'm gonna do this with two hands because I don't want to drop this screw down the bottom of the engine. Okay, that's in. That is literally just a locating screw there. So I can zoom that. So I've just done that up tight by hand. I've not used a wrench on it or a ratchet. Just this is purely a, a thing to hold the sensor in position. The sensor seals with the O-ring that goes in the hole. Right, now, where's the connector for that? There it is. Find that, make sure it's clean. Fairly clean. Don't any dirt in the holes. Right, listen for the click. There you go. Right, so that's in. The barb is clicked, definitely clicked. Right, okay, so I'm going to now cut the cable tie that I put on. Let's put this thing back in. I might stick a cable tie around that just to kind of hold that. Maybe it will swell up when it gets hot water through it. I don't know. Just, just doesn't seem to be holding. It's not broken. It's just loose. Right, that is it. The only other thing is the engine cover. But before I fit that, I'm going to clear all my tools off the front of the engine bay. Right, last check, just to be sure. Oh, I need a cable tie, don't I? Somewhere down in there. I need a cable tie there just to hold that to that little post. Sensors, three connections, two sensors, one for the motor. That's in, tightened up three holes, three, uh, three screws. The Michelor clamps are done up tight. I think that's it. Right. Let's start the car. Let's see how that sounds. The proof will be a test drive. Should have washed my hands first. Okay, 
Now, the engine light, it actually went off and has then come back on. Doesn't mean the fault is still here, it means that the error has not been cleared. Okay, so I'll do that using my little code reader. We'll do that in a moment. Let's just have a little look in the engine bay. Let's see how it sounds. It's all good. That's all really good. No kind of whistly noises, no strange uh, smoky smells and fumey bits and gas coming out of any hoses. So let's turn that off. Okay. Code reader. Right. Enter. Waiting for vehicle. All right, let's start up. Right. Okay, so the light is still on. do is we'll read the codes first. Now it will still have the old error in there but we can then erase so that erase goes up. Are you sure? Yes. Erase is done. Press any key. Right and the light has gone off as we've cleared the error. And then just to be sure we can read code again no codes okay now I will need to go for a drive just to prove everything's fine but the check engine light is off and the engine has started and sounds fine so I think that's all sorted I'm gonna go for a quick drive around the block now put my foot down see if the car runs okay and then Perhaps as a separate video, I'll do some acceleration tests and we'll see if there's any difference in the, uh, the 30 to 70 miles per hour acceleration in fourth gear. I've just got back from a test drive. Everything was good. No issues at all. The check engine light stayed off. No smoke or whirring noises coming from the turbocharger. The car felt really good actually nice and powerful really really good so hopefully that's that issue sorted the only thing left to do now is refit the cover which I will do get that sort of wiggled in there in a moment thank you very much for watching I hope this was useful don't forget to like and subscribe and I'll see you in the next video Thank you. Bye.